as we have finished uh, learning the anatomy of inner ear. I am sure there is no uh, doubt in this picture. This green is the endolymphatic system and the other outside is the uh, perilymphatic system or the bony labyrinth. Now my question is, can you find, tell me one difference between these two? Uh, between this one important uh, difference, don't tell me that this one is larger and this one is smaller. But what is the difference? That it is very clear from this is that the in this picture the endolymphatic system is distended or the endolymphatic system is bigger, isn't it? Compared to this, so there is distension of the endolymphatic system or the endolymphatic hydrops in this picture and this is the basic pathogenesis of Meniere's disease and today's topic is Meniere's disease. Why, many, why it is called Meniere's disease? Because it was first described by a French otologist called Prosper Menier. Prosper Menier uh, first described it in 1861 and it was a symptom complex. Okay, there are mainly three symptoms. So what happens here? Due to uh, so many causes, this endolymphatic system distends. It distends, distends, distends. At one point, it bursts out. So what happens? This endolymph and the here there is a perilymph, isn't it? This part. This part is filled with a perilymph. So this endolymph mixes with the perilymph. So there is ionic imbalance or there is ionic disturbances between because this endolymph is more in what? more in potassium and calcium so it mixes with the perilymph so there is ionic disturbances which causes symptom and what are the main symptom it is a symptom triad i already told you there is uh, first there is vertigo and then uh, it is associated with the tinnitus and there is also sensory neural hearing loss this is a classical triad and sometimes there is a fourth symptom which is an oral fullness. Okay, so it's very uh, simple that Meniere's disease first described by French otologist Prosper Meniere and the uh, basic pathogenesis is distension of the endolymphatic system and there is a symptom uh, complex of vertigo. Um, tinnitus and sensory neural hearing loss often associated with the fullness of the ear. And one uh, characteristic uh, description is that I already told you at one point this endolymphatic uh, system burst out so that there is mixing between the perilymph and the endolymph. And after this, whole, uh, this endolymph has uh, gone into the perilymph the pressure in, inside the endolymphatic system decreases, so it again closes. You imagine a balloon uh, or something with pressure uh, or a pressure cooker. Think of a pressure cooker. The pressure is build up, build up. It uh, goes out through the whistle and again the pressure comes, comes back to normal. And when it comes back to normal, the whole uh, symptoms will, will be uh, relieved. The patient will be relieved of symptom. And there will be a symptom free interval of that we can we cannot tell that varies. Sometimes it will be too often, and in some patient the, there will be the symptom free interval will be too long, maybe years. Manias disease has been reported as early as four years of age, but it is common in 30 to 60 age group. And usually it is unilateral, but at later stages it can affect both ears bilateral. And male to uh, female incidence is almost equal, one is to one. And why this happens? Why there is an endolymphatic hydrops? 
Exact etiology is unknown. Like in so many diseases in medicine, the exact etiology unknown. So primary etiology unknown. There are so many hypotheses or theories explained. And mostly it is secondary endolymphatic eye drops. That is secondary to some other conditions. Like what? One is a viral. Okay, what? Which all viruses? Uh, cytomegalovirus, then herpes uh, simplex and uh, herpes zoster or varicella zoster. So herpes simplex, cytomegalovirus and uh, varicella zoster infection. Uh, another one is allergy. Allergy to certain food and uh, inhalants. Then hereditary is also uh, uh, supposed to be a cause which is uh, autosomal dominant inheritance. It uh, runs in families in around 10 to 20 percentage of cases. And then autoimmune etiology. Uh, when the exact etiology is not known, we can tell as autoimmune. So, uh, some major genetically determined major histocompatibility complexes has been identified. And the human leukocyte antigen, which is uh, B8, DR3, and uh, CW7. They are the main human leukocyte antigens identified. Trauma, uh, then syphilis, uh, certain allergens, especially to uh, certain food stuff and inhalants, they are all uh, will contribute to this endolymphatic hydrops. So what, uh, what is the pathogenesis? Here, either there is overproduction of the endolymph or there is defective absorption of the uh, endolymph. Either it should produce normally and it, uh, it is absorbing normally in a normal recycling process. So if there is damage at the level of production or there is defect at the level of absorption, then this uh, endolymph will accumulate. Uh, in an acute stage, what happened? There is, uh, usually this happens, start with the cochlea, then uh, saccule, utricle and the semicircular canal. And the last two effect is the endolymphatic uh, duct and the endolymphatic sac. At one stage, this membrane is labyrinth. I already told that at one stage, this membrane is labyrinth ruptures. And the endolymph, which is high in uh, potassium, and this potassium ions will cause depolarization of the uh, neurons of the vestibular and the cochlear system. Both here, cochlear as well as the vestibular system. And this will inactivate the vestibular and the auditory neurons. So the, what will happen? There will be paralytic what, uh, nystagmus. Paralytic nystagmus in um, associated with the vertigo. What, uh, what will happen in a paralytic phase? There will be nystagmus beating towards the normal ear. That is uh, away from the diseased ear. Okay. So there will be vertigo and this part affected there is vertigo and if this cochlear part affection causes a sensory neural hearing loss also. So along with this there will be tinnitus or the ringing sensation in the ear and also in some cases there will be a fullness because you imagine this endolymphatic hydrops is there so there will be a fullness feeling of fullness in the ear. So and that is fluctuating because at one point this will rupture and later this membrane closes and the regenerating process will happen and at that phase the patient will be uh, symptom free. So it is fluctuating also. Right? Don't forget that it is a fluctuating vertigo, tinnitus and a sensory neural hearing loss. In normal uh, usual cases, in most of the cases, the first symptom is vertigo. This will be the first one and from there second is tinnitus and from there goes the sensory neural hearing loss. Usually it happens at the uh, late phase. And this vertigo has got a characteristic features. They are spinning vertigo. They feel like Spinning in the world. Spinning vertigo in horizontal axis. Right? So spinning vertigo in horizontal axis usually lasts for 2 to 3 hours. When the patient is telling you that I am having this feeling the one week, it is usually inconsistent. So you have to specifically ask for the symptom. Sometimes the patient will tell us a lightheadedness which happen in between the vertigo. And the typical vertigo of Meniere's disease is spinning type in the uh, horizontal axis which lasts for 2 to 3 hours. How will you describe the sensory neural hearing loss? It is, one is fluctuating. 
second one progressive okay and uh, low frequency typically fluctuating progressing and uh, progressive and low frequency hearing loss associated with these two one is diplacusis diplacusis means in each ear there will be difference in the uh, hearing level pitch level and recruitment recruitment is intolerance to uh, loud sound which happens typically in cochlear uh, pathology right cochlear type of hear, uh, sensory neural hearing loss happens in recruitment so it is a uh, low frequency fluctuating progressive hearing loss which is there is also diplacusis and also uh, recruitment uh, what about the tinnitus tinnitus is usually it is non pulsatile it is it may be continuous or intermittent and it is roaring or hissing type all these characters will be there and usually in before uh, acute attack the patient will feel a tinnitus all this will start with the tinnitus and with the tinnitus all this uh, vertigo and hearing loss will happen okay and this tinnitus will go for a complete remission in between attacks one another term uh, usually asked is Lermoid syndrome this one L A R M O Y E S it this thing Lermoid uh, attack or uh, Lermoid syndrome and uh, in usual case I told you there is first vertigo then tinnitus and later on this sensory neural hearing loss happens but the opposite the everything ulta in Lermoid that is first there will be a sensory neural hearing loss associated with the tinnitus and uh, later on this vertigo happen and when the vertigo happens the sensory neural hearing loss will improve got it in lermoid syndrome the disease it's a, actually it is a variant of various disease that starts with the sensory neural hearing loss and a ringing sensation in the ear and later when the sensory neural hearing loss improves the patient will develop vertigo right that is lermoid syndrome or the lermoid attack and one another thing which happens here is drop attack drop attacks will happen what is that drop attacks or uh, uh, tumor autolith crisis of tumor kin right autolith crisis of tumor kin or tumor kin crisis what is that the patient will tell you that someone has pushed me from behind so there will be a sudden feeling of falling down without loss of consciousness or vertigo right that is this uh, tumarkin uh, autolithic crisis of tumarkin or a drop attack there will be a sudden uh, feeling or sometimes the patient will fall down suddenly without a loss of consciousness that is important without loss of consciousness or vertigo and what is happening there it is um, there will be an acute sacro utricular insufficiency or there will be a utricular sacular dysfunction which lead to inappropriate postural adjustment in our classes on physiology of balance we discussed about the vestibulo spinal pathway here there will be uh, utricular sacular dysfunction which lead to a defective vestibulo spinal pathway so that the patient will have a sudden fall without loss of consciousness or vertigo and that is the uh, drop attack or autolithic crisis of tumarkin and when the patient tell you or when the patient is having this symptom you should always um, rule out uh, cardiogenic causes or a vertebro basilar insufficiency or migraine okay other than many years disease this uh, cardiogenic problem or uh, vertebro basilar insufficiency or many years uh, migraine all the three migraine vertebro basilar insufficiency and cardiogenic problem should uh, should be ruled out american academy of otolaryngology and head and neck surgery uh, has made certain criteria for the diagnosis of many years disease that is important uh, for your reporting of manias for the treatment guidelines this is important that is divided into one is certain a certain diagnosis of uh, manias can be given only after uh, histopathology
by after post uh, during post mortem okay after death when you do a post mortem then only that post mortem uh, specimen histopathology then only you can tell it as a certain meniere's disease okay so certain is histopathology with definite both should be there and the definite meniere's is there should be a vertigo of two or more episodes of vertigo uh, along with that there will be sensory neural hearing loss and this vertigo should be the typical typical whirling or the spinning vertigo in the horizontal axis which lasts for minimum 20 segment 20 minutes so 20 minutes or more along with that there should be a sensory neural hearing loss which is low frequency and uh, fluctuating tinnitus and also oral fullness and all other causes should be excluded okay so then it is uh, definite and another one is probable in probable all the features of uh, definite but one difference is that in uh, definite meniere's disease i said vertigo should be equal to or more than more than or equal to two episodes but when the uh, episode of vertigo is one okay when there is only one attack of vertigo during the end day period along with there is sensory neural hearing loss tinnitus and oral fullness and if all other causes are excluded we can categorize it under probable again one the fourth one is a possible one which is again divided into a vestibular variant and a cochlear variant what is a vestibular variant think of this part only this part vestibular cochlea is excluded so what will be excluded if the cochlea is excluded there won't be any hearing problem right so in the vestibular variant there will be only vertigo along with the uh, oral fullness may or may not be present so there will be definitely there will be an attacks of uh, vertigo without any sensory neural hearing loss and in the cochlear variant what will happen it's very easy cochlear variant only this part is affected isn't it so there will be there won't be any vertigo but the patient will be uh, having a sensory neural hearing loss so in the cochlear variant there will be sensory neural hearing loss without attacks of vertigo and in the vestibular variant, there will be vertigo without sensory neural hearing loss and also, uh, surely other causes should be excluded. So, according to the uh, Academy of American Association of Head and Neck Surgery, certain, definite, probable and possible meniere's disease. Uh, you should know the conditions which may mimic uh, meniere's or in other words, the differential diagnosis of meniere's disease. What are they? It is here written here. One is a vestibular neuritis, another one is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo and acoustic neuroma. They are the three very common differential diagnoses of Meniere's disease. We can write our Meniere's disease here. Okay. So, uh, what will be the differences? One is a type of uh, dizziness. First, we, will, uh, we can comment about the uh, vertigo or the dizziness type. So, uh, the type is, here it is a rolling or a whirling type of vertigo, right? Spinning type of vertigo, which is same here also. Uh, in a vestibular neuritis also, uh, you will get the uh, same type. And in BBPV also, in BBPV also we will get a uh, type of vertigo but in acoustic neuroma it is not characteristic. Usually acoustic neuroma the patient will complain of an unsteadiness. It is not the typical vertigo you get. Right? And second type of vertigo I told. This is the uh, duration. Right? And uh, regarding the duration, in many instances I already told how, how long the uh, vertigo will last. It will last for hours. Okay. So it is usually for hours. And in vestibular neuritis, it can continue for days. Right? BPPV, it is very short attacks. Seconds. Here, 
In acoustic neuroma, the typically uh, it can happen recurrent attacks or it can be chronic attack. The patient will have it for a long time, long periods of attack. So it's usually chronic. And what is the other symptom associated with vertigo? It is the tinnitus. So in Meniere's disease, tinnitus is present. Vestibular neuritis, tinnitus present. In BPPV, tinnitus present. But in acoustic neuroma, the tinnitus will be absent. Okay, so that is tinnitus, which is which will be absent in a case of a acoustic neuroma. In a case of Meniere's disease, there will be associated autosomal imbalances and also there will be nausea and vomiting. Okay. Vertigo is usually associated with a so, uh, vomiting in very common in a case of Meniere's disease. Vestibular neuritis, uh, we can tell it as uh, always, always associated. Okay. And BPPV it is rare. And in acoustic neuroma term is uncommon. This is a classical description. Uncommon. So it is very common. Uncommon in acoustic neuroma. It is always present in vestibular neuritis and it is very rare in a BPP. What is the other, other thing? It is a sensory neural hearing loss. So in Meniere's disease it is a fluctuating uh, cochlear type of hearing loss. Isn't it? Cochlear type. So the CC score will be high and absent tone decay, right? And in vestibular neuritis and BPPV, sensory neural hearing loss will be absent. And what about the acoustic neuroma? It is usually neural type, isn't it? It is neural type of sensory neural uh, hearing loss. So it will be progressive. But here it is fluctuating. The typical of Meniere's is typical Meniere's uh, disease. There will be a fluctuating sensory neural hearing loss, which is cochlear type. But in acoustic neuroma, it is progressive neural type of hearing loss. Cranial nerve involvement. Lower cranial nerve uh, will be involved in a case of acoustic neuroma. Late stage, especially in the late stages of acoustic neuroma, cranial nerve involvement will be there, but it will be absent in all these cases. So this, this you have to know about the uh, regarding the differential diagnosis of Meniere's disease. Mainly the benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, vestibular neuritis and acoustic neuroma. Right? And for confirmation there are mainly there are uh, sp a puritan audiogram, speech audiogram and some special test. Puritan audiogram. This is uh, hearing loss in DB and frequencies. Uh, in the early stages, there will be a low frequency sensory neural hearing loss. Early stages, lower frequencies will be affected and the higher frequencies will be almost normal. Red color. Which ear? It is for right ear. For the right ear we use a red color for plotting the pure audiogram, right? So in the early phases, the lower frequencies will be affected and the, this, as the disease progresses it goes for a flat curve and then in the late stages the higher frequencies will be affected. Okay, so this is a typical uh, audiogram, pure audiogram. If you take the pure average of uh, 500, 1000, 2000 and 3000, take the pure uh, average of these frequencies. Uh, of the worst year. By that we can stage the Meniere's disease into stage 1 2 3 and 4. How? For stage 1 it will be uh, less than 25 dB. That is the pure average of the worst year Calculated for the 500, 1000, 2000 and 3000. Okay. 3000. If it is between uh, 26 to 40 dB, it is stage 2. 
and for 41 to 70 it is stage 3 and uh, more than 71 uh, more than 70 it is stage 4 so this is another type of uh, staging of the meniere according to the Puritan average of the worst year this is a cochlear type of hearing loss so there will be recruitment will be present and there will be high CC, short increment sensitivity index will be high and tone decay will be absent. So, puritan audiometry will you get a low frequency hearing loss for early stages. The recruitment will be present. Then uh, high CC score and then absent tone decay. And what about the speech audiometry? Speech discrimination score. Usually it is around 50 to 53 percentage but it will be worse uh, during and immediately following an attack. Another important investigation is electrocochleography. Electrocochleography. Okay. And uh, this is diagnostic of uh, Meniere's disease. What is that? How will you get a what is uh, get a what is a normal electrocochleographic curve? That is uh, this is the uh, millivolts and this is the uh, baseline. Okay, this is the baseline. And if you give a stimulus here, this stimulus, there will be a summating potential. Then there will be an action potential, right? So this is the summating potential. Here comes the stimulus and this is the summating potential and then there will be an action potential. This is a normal electrocochleography. So if you take the uh, ratio of this summating potential to action potential, this is usually summating potential is 30 percentage of the action potential. Okay, this is normal. And what happens in a uh, many years, the summating potential to action potential ratio is enhanced. So it will be like this. Okay, summating potential uh, to action potential ratio will be enhanced. This will be the if you take this as a baseline, right? This ratio will be more than 30 percentage. Usually it is 30 percentage. So it will be more than 30 percentage in a case of Meniere's disease. So electrocochleography is diagnostic. Other tests of uh, diagnosis are uh, caloric test and also electronistagmography. So in caloric uh, test what will you get? You get a reduced response. Most of the cases. There will be canal paresis. And uh, actually what happened? There will be irritative nystagmus towards the same side. And later on, paralytic nystagmus towards the contralateral side, isn't it? So what happened? There will be canal paresis and there will be later there will be, uh, some cases there will be a directional preponderance to the opposite side. So in most of the cases there will be canal paresis and sometimes you will get a directional preponderance towards the opposite side. And another test which has got a diagnostic as well as prognostic value is glycerol test. Okay, what is this, uh, what is the importance of this glycerol? Glycerol is actually a dehydrating agent, isn't it? So, if you give uh, glycerol, this endolymphatic hydroxyl shrink. So, so, there should be an improvement. So, after, uh, before giving uh, glycerol, you do a pattern audiogram as well as electrocochleography. You get a typical sensory neural hearing loss and also there will be a electrocochleography what will be there? I already told there will be an enhancement of the SPAP ratio to give glycerol orally and after 1 to 2 hours again take a puritan audiogram as well as electrocochleogram. Electrocochleogram. So there should be improvement. Improvement in hearing and also this uh, uh, SPAP ratio should revert almost towards the normal after giving it glycerol. If there is an improvement that shows that it is definitely of many years and also it has got a good prognostic value for giving a dehydrating agent and also 
in endolymphatic sac shunt surgeries. Okay. So visceral test has got uh, diagnostic value and also prognostic value for determining the treatment. That is for giving a uh, diuretic therapy and also for endolymphatic sac shunt. Can you tell me what is the exact uh, cause of Meniere's disease? Yeah, there is no exact etiology. So as far as there is no exact etiology, there is no curative treatment for Meniere's disease. We can give uh, medicines and also there is surgery. Uh, we do surgery uh, in patients who fail maximum medical therapy. So, so, indication for surgery is patients who fail maximum medical therapy. So, what are the uh, medicines which can be given? What is the uh, medical treatment? We can divide that into general, then during an acute phase, that is when there is uh, active episode and in between attack. So, in general, as this disease causes high level of stress and anxiety, reassure the patient. That is important. Tell the benign nature of the condition. And also there should be lifestyle modifications. So uh, avoid what all things smoking, then alcohol, low salt diet, uh, restrict to 2 grams per day and also low intake of caffeine that is tea and coffee. Right? And in an acute phase, when there is severe symptom, there, that time also reassurance and bed rest is needed and also we can give vestibular sedatives to uh, sedate him, sedate the vestibule. What are the vestibular sedatives you know? Vestibular sedative. Vestibular sedatives mainly uh, prochlorparacin that is stematin, then promethacin theoclate that is uh, avomin. Again, diamond hydronate and diazepa, all these can be uh, given as vestibular sedatives. And again, uh, vasodilators, that is another medicine which can be given, vasodilators, which increases the circulation of the labyrinth. Labyrinth and circulation is increased, that is, uh, beta histin is one among them. Okay, so mainly reassurance, bed rest, vestibular sedatives, and vasodilators during an acute phase. And in the chronic phase, again, we can give a diet, uh, again a restriction of salt and fluid, then diuretics can be given, especially flusamide, then again vasodilators and another is symptomatic management. Uh, according to the patient uh, symptomatology and if there is a uh, patient is having endocrine disorders like in hypothyroidism, then stabilize the hormonal level. And also elimination of allergen is important. Allergen, as this allergy is one of the cause of uh, Meniere's disease, elimination of allergen should be advised. And if all this, uh, and one another one is uh, Meniere device. Along uh, with that, we can also give a Meniere. What is this uh, Meniere device? Many device is we are uh, giving a positive uh, pulse pressure into the external auditory canal. So from the external auditory canal, it will go towards the round window. So in the external auditory canal, we put a ventilation tube in the timbalic membrane. So when this positive pressure will go through this ventilation tube, it will go into the round window and this will give a pressure over the labyrinth. So each time a pulse wave goes, this uh, endolymph, at, endolymph in the um, membranous labyrinth will get uh, projected or propels into the, through the endolymphatic sac, it will be uh, absorbed. Okay, that is the basic uh, principle of this Meniere's device. Another is uh, exercises, head and neck exercises, especially the Cotone's head exercises, head and neck exercises. Okay, the Cotone's head exercises is also advised during a chronic phase, if not given in acute phase, no exercises during acute phase. If the patient fail all this, then we go for surgery, mainly there are uh, 
hearing preservation surgeries and hearing destructive surgery. Okay. So under Meniere's disease, uh, you have to know about the uh, etiology, what is the basic pathogenesis, then what are the clinical features, investigation that is also important, investigation is very important, pyotron audiogram, speech discrimination score, then uh, glycerol test, uh, uh, cold, caloric test um, and also the treatment both medical as well as surgical.